Hi, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm speaking today about poetry in the theater, or perhaps more precisely, poetry in the theatrical image. At first, I'm going to speak more theoretically, and then I'm going to give a, more, uh, a couple more deeply described examples, and then I'm going to show a couple of slides and talk about them. The theater is a box in the same way a sonnet is a box. In both cases, this boxiness, this limitation of space and time, this formal restriction is not a fault of the form or an impoverishment of some kind, but the glory and the delight of the enterprise itself for both the makers and the receivers of it. The whole joy and suspense for both is in seeing the infinite and ingenious ways that box is made to contain the world, and how its formal limitations are a spur to the imagination. As Woodsworth says in his sonnet about the sonnet form, nuns fret not at their convent's narrow cell. One could say, I suppose, that painting, that a blank canvas is a box as well, and that is true. However, in the theater, we're showing not one image, but the world of images, thousands and thousands, one after the other. We have to keep changing what that box is filled with. The theater is the un in the unique position in the arts of showing and telling at the same time, of having at least two competing systems of signification, language and image, operating at once. And in music theater, there's a third language, which is the arc of the music itself in opera. All of this with the additional unbelievably rigorous limitation that film does not have of happening within a single physical space into which everything that exists must be physically hauled off or on. Because we're trying to put the world in a box, we rely not only as Shakespeare did on making scenery in words, but employing the poetic tricks and tropes of literature in very material ways. Theater is the site and manifestation of metaphor in the world. It is wholly dependent on metaphor and visible metaphor metaphor that calls attention to itself is, for me, the essence of what we call theatricality. When I say the theater is the side of metaphor, I don't just mean that its language contains metaphor or that there are symbols in play texts as there are in any text, but rather that the entire act of representing the world inside a room relies on substituting one thing for another and calling one thing another. Kenneth Branagh is Hamlet is a metaphor, just as my love is a rose is a metaphor. And for me, the pleasure in the theatrical is the pleasure in taking part in the transformation, in lending a hand to the transformation, whereby the audience agrees with the offer of the production to understand that this chair for the next three hours is the throne of the King of England, that these few branches are standing in for an implied entire forest, that these painted walls are real walls, that this Ark of Covent Garden stands in for the whole of implied Covent Garden, ex which extends unseen behind the proscenium wall. All all of these scenic moves are the physical manifestation of metaphor, the parts of metonymy, synecdoche, and even synesthesia, as when, in my own Arabian Nights, the sound of a bell shop ringing means that someone's entered the shop, even though there's no door or no shop on stage. Now, I must pause here and say that this idea of theater as metaphor is articulated best by Bert States in a great book called Great Reckonings and Little Rooms. And I owe a lot to the way I articulate my own practice to States. But lest you wonder why you didn't invite him instead of me, and maybe you should have, I'll say that I'm extending that thinking here a bit, particularly with regard to the adaptation of literary texts for the stage and my own observations, experience, and my own examples. It is natural that in the kind of theater I've done, there is this enormous reliance on the shorthand of metaphor because I'm almost never doing a work that was written to be in the theater, but rather adapting an ancient work that was originally oral and indeed very often poems, epic poems, and was not meant ever to be fully realized in a conventional embodiment on stage. It wasn't crafted or written with that in mind. In other words, a playwright writing for the stage tends to conceive for that stage, for the physical possibilities of a stage, thinking specifically for that box. But what I've done is adapt fairy tales, myths, old poems, old epic poems, and a couple of novels, and none of them were conceived with any thought of the trouble they would cause me or anyone else trying to put their acts and their images on the stage into that limited box. They have events of massive scale, such as uh, sea voyages or battles. They change location or move through the e years with a wave of a phrase. They contain marvelous and impossible transformations such as people turning into birds or into rivers and so on like that. They're not Aristotelian of any kind of unity of place and time and space. So the only thing an adapter of these texts such as myself can do 
is use the shorthand of those tricks of the literary trade and to make those tricks in part the pleasure of the event. For me, it's a fundamental aspect of the pleasure of poetry that its language is simultaneously compressed and efficient in terms of syntax, yet paradoxically overabundant in the amount of image or signification packed into that syntax. So for instance, yesterday I was noticing that the newly barren tree branches on some of the smaller trees now, and I thought, as I do every fall, uh, bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. That sentence is, phrase is wildly compressed. In prose, it'd be something like, look how those branches look in some way like the remains of a church, particularly the tracery of Gothic windows and the crumbling ruin where the glass has fallen out from the windows and now everything's as silent. Yes, even the choirs of the church, and just as the choirs once had people singing in them, the branches when they had leaves had birds singing in them, but now no more because it's winter and everything is lost. That's the act of compression that's taking place. But on the other hand, the phrase is an extravagantly, extravagantly abundant one to describe a tree branch. For me, the theatrical resides in the moment when the audience is asked to participate in blatant illusion and to notice the comparison, the comparison that's being made um, between what you're seeing on stage and what you're asked to call it when we're presented simultaneously with an image and how that image is made. So for instance, uh, you know, very simple examples from my own work, how to do a camel is just two people with a rope uh, latched between them walking a certain way, and they're both one camel with four feet and two humps, or two camels, uh, because there's two different people on top of them. A genie flying through the air is someone held up over their heads with arms outstretched, dying is sinking to the ground and being rolled away by an uh, invisible wind. A flying carpet is an ottoman with an oversized long carpet stretched on it and held up with someone on it and lifted above the shoulders of the players. Sex is rolling around with each other, but no clothes removed. The dawn is a ring of symbols. A row of people lying on the floor becomes not only a whole sleeping village, but the road a poor man traverses to come to that village. A person turns in place to be suddenly in another place as the sound of crickets and owls made by the actors just changes into the sound of morning birds and the light shift, but nothing else. In all of these images, the mechanics of the image are 100% on the surface and exposed. Something that is anathema to film, where the greatest sin would be for the means of production to be revealed, the stray shadow of the microphone, discontinuity in the shot, the lines of the wig. In the theater, we revel in the moment, such as in Anthony Minghella's production of Madame Butterfly, the opera, when, when a Upon stabbing herself, Butterfly's silk scarlet obi is pulled out from her by a dancer and settles on the floor exactly like a pool of blood, though it is not a pool of blood. And we know that she's been wrapped in that destiny in her obi from the beginning of the opera. We see the image. We see it being made. We know what it stands for. We feel the presence of the metaphor of the comparison. It is visible. And the virtuosity of that direction, that poetic direction, in the same way when we read a poem, we see through the words to its content, and I know that's a false distinction, but just go with me for a minute. We see through the surface of the words to the image behind them, while simultaneously our attention is snagged on the quality and virtuosity of that language, the miracle of its compression. The language is simultaneously transparent and opaque, and that's what I look for, and that's what I really try to lean towards in my own practice. The kind of theatrical poetic images of shows I'm talking about are overabundant to their function. At some times they appear in contrast to what's being described or referred to in the spoken discourse. I don't primarily direct plays that would convey essentially the same experience if they were heard on the radio. The visual is doing something beyond simply amplifying the, the <coughs> psychological, the, the, the setting that is being described in the dialogue. Uh, they're not realistic extensions of that, but something else, an abstracted field of play that can constantly bend to encompass and signify many different places and shift and slide and scale. And the images I try to make in the theater, or I like when others do, are the, the same as I like in poetry, quick, efficient, but layered, and particularly layered in that the physical image I'm showing and the image it is describing in the text sitting right on top of it do not exactly match up, though they are experienced simultaneously by the audience. And this is an advantage of the theater, that we can do two things at once, that this showing and telling happens simultaneously. And between the two, this new idea, this new metaphor is created. All right, some examples. Uh, I staged the notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci, and part of the reason I did that was because when I read his writing, it felt to me that it had this throbbing metaphor inside it, 
though when he's speaking about one thing, he does it in such a way as to be appearing to also speak about something else. An example is um, he is writing a little discourse on why anatomical drawing is a necessity and we shouldn't just dis um, describe things but learn how to draw them. And this is part of the argument for autopsy as well. And he says, for with what words can you describe this human heart without filling a whole book? Yet the more detail you try to write concerning it, the more you will confuse the mind of the hearer. And you will always need commentators or to go back to the experience. And this, with you, is very brief and only deals with a few things as compared with the extent of the subject concerning which you desire complete knowledge. I feel a huge weight in that beyond an argument for drawing. And on stage, we had you know, six actors, and I think they were doing a sort of breathing thing and striking their chest and doing this exhalation and inhalation through that while someone spoke it, and the lights were exhaling and inhaling at the same time. Then this, from the treatise on painting, this is about, it, all it is is how to paint white things on canvas, but it feels as though it's a metaphor for something else. And the way we stage this, if I can describe it first, is just that um, there's a woman in white in a slip, and she's walking slowly, and over her is a man, a very tall African-American man dressed in dark clothing, and I used to work with all the time, Paula Stovall, holding a parasol that's only a skeletal gold armature of the parasol, and then from the parasol are hanging gold threads around its circumference, uh, circumference, <laughs> the word is, circumference. And uh, Marianne Mayberry, as the girl, is inside that golden thing, and she walks, and as she walks from a drawer in the side of the stage, a meadow is pulled, and she turns by it, and then another thing is lifted out from a file cabinet on the side of the stage, and it's a three-dimensional modeling of a drawing of a white flower of Leonardo's. And as she walks, she tries to reach towards it, and eludes her, she tries to reach towards it, and eludes So that's what's happening during this. If you would represent a white body surrounded by a great deal of air, pay attention to the colors of the objects opposite, for white has no color in itself, but is tinged and transformed in part by the color which is in these objects. If you see a woman dressed in white in the country, that part of the woman which is exposed to the sun will be bright in color in such a way that in part it will hurt the eyes as the sun does that part of the woman which is exposed to the luminous air through the weaving and penetrating of the sun's rays upon it will tend towards blue, since the air is blue. If on the surface of the earth nearby there be a meadow and the woman finds herself between the meadow and the illuminated sky, sun, you will see the parts of those folds which face the meadow tinged with the color of the meadow by reflected rays. Thus, the body continues to transform itself through the colors of the luminous and non-luminous objects nearby. And this felt to me like it was as much about identity and the fluid sense of uh, self as a fluid thing, that we are tinged and transformed by our circumstances, by who we meet. And on another level, it's even about race and the color of skin and how that's red. Um, I did the Odyssey as well, and this is from the reunion of Penelope and Odysseus. Part of the reason I had someone narrating this is because it's irresistible as a piece of poetry, of text. Um, Athena narrates it. At the beginning of the show, we saw her put on some boots, which she named as golden sandals, for her mission to get Odysseus home. At this moment, he's home. He's reuniting with Penelope. All that's happening between those two figures is they're walking slowly towards each other. They embrace. He picks her up. He puts her down. They kind of roll over each other, and then they look at each other. Um, but she is sitting on the corner, she does this, and she's untying her boots, she's taking them off. So at the moment that she is, she's sort of in love with Odysseus, the moment that he is returned to Penelope, he's released from her, and she says, now from his breast into his eyes the ache of longing mounted, and he wept at last, his dear wife, clear and faithful in his arms, longed for as the sun-warmed earth is longed for by a swimmer spent in rough water where his ship went down under Poseidon's blows, gale winds, and tons of sea. Few men can keep alive through a big surf to crawl, clotted in joy, knowing the abyss behind. And so she too rejoiced, her gaze upon her husband, her white arms around him pressed as though forever. Hopefully the marriage of what's happening on stage and what's being spoken or described here is profitable one, uh, a profitable one in, a, in 
because they can't, they don't exactly match. Between the two, there's a bit of difference, and that difference awakens us both to the image and the text, and they create something other than the sensual experience that exceeds the experience of just watching or just reading. Um, I also did the death of the suitors by piercing bags of sand above their heads, Athena with her long spear, and each suitor had a little trail in a spotlight of this sand, and as they sunk beneath that sand, it became, it went on for three minutes, sort of both um, dust to dust, them being buried, and sands through an uh, hourglass, and also through an optical illusion when they fell on the floor, it looked as though the sand were rising from them. And that was an image, a very early thing I did that I'm sort of proud of. All right, let's go to some examples. And, ah, uh, okay. This is, in a way, where it all began for me. This is, um, I, I read Edith Hamilton's mythology as a child, and the idea of psyche being forbidden to look on love was very, very striking to me. And there was a line drawing, and I bet some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, of her holding the curtain aside and looking down at Eros there. And psyche means the soul, and I've never in my life understood why it is forbidden for the soul to look directly on love. But that metaphor, whatever that means, holds me. And I have done this show, it went through six years of being in different places, and I've never come to the bottom of that mystery. And so in this case, the image is actually quite literal. There she is looking down, and in fact, he's floating in water. You can't see, they're all in water. But um, as she looks, she actually tilts, and the candles actually spill wax on him, and he, he startles up. And the whole myth was reduced to this image. It was the sort of this image developed slowly as the myth was narrated. It only came to this moment, although that myth has many, many parts and many plot elements. This was the thing that mattered. And because the metaphoric content is so high, the illustration's actually quite literal. All right, oops, I think I went back, all right? This is from 11 Rooms of Proust. It was in a warehouse. Proust is the most literary of writers. And we found this room, painted it red. It's a text about obsession, about Proust being unable to forget Odette. My set designer and I wrote on every corner of those walls, Odette, in every size. We wrote paragraphs that were punctuated in only one word, Odette. And that red room felt like both the inside of his head, the inside of his heart. That weird box in it was found. It belonged in the warehouse. I have no idea what it was. But we did find in a store next door on the wall, we put one of those oops, entomological displays of butterflies pinned to the wall. And the narrator stood, the audience came in, the light slowly illuminated so that you slowly saw where you were. He tried to get comfortable in that box as she did this text about trying to escape the thought of Odette, not being able to. But one thing that's really added is this figure of Eros under the box, which I added, and those wings he has are not only another set of, they're not another set of wings or a similar set, they are the set of wings for metamorphoses, which we then destroyed and broke the arrow in half. And this is a kind of private narrative for me because I felt differently about love when I got to this point than I did when I did metamorphoses. The last thing I'm just gonna say is, um, that the, well, the wings in these two images are like Stephen's uh, blackbird appearing in one way and then another in a kind of cross-play across works in a personal poetry for me. Those wings, that arrow, a parasol, and some chairs move through my work like Stephen's blackbird moves through those 13 stanzas, occupying different parts of the sentence and different levels of signification. The audience has to collaborate in making these images. It has to grant that something's going on. It has to join hands with the storytellers to complete uh, the circuit of understanding. And what is miraculous is that it's done outside of words, outside of normal discourse. And what is so moving about that is that it implies that with all in, within all of us is a shared pool of understanding. We're communicating, though we're strangers, in the language of lovers. The unbroken gaze of the audience towards the figures on stage is the gaze of the lover in that tight face-to-face -face way on the pillow, that hungry gaze. And when it works, this circuit creates intimacy because we understand that we are only understanding each other by drawing on, some, on something beyond words that is shared. And on a profound and unconscious level, I think this works to defeat loneliness. And that's what it's all about. Thank you. Thank you.